Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We've all heard people say, I'm doing the best I can. And frequently when someone says that, the others just give them a pass. I mean, if they're doing the best that they can, you have to accept it. We'll realize something. God will never accept your best. You're never going to stand before his judgment and say, but God, I did the best I could. And him say, well, then, okay. Enter into my kingdom. That's good enough. We need to realize something. That the word of God says that we need to be a new creation. We need to be what the Bible calls regenerated, that is, spiritually renewed, in order to do the things that God desires. And not just that He desires, but in actuality, He demands, He commands us to behave in this way. If we're going to be pleasing to Him, I'm reminded of a verse of Scripture. From the book of Romans and chapter 12, there Paul is speaking and he also gives some commands under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That is, be that new creation. Experience that change that only that the Holy Spirit can bring about in a person's life regeneration and here's what I want you to see in saying that be transformed he tells us how by the renewed mind now if you look in your Bible it will probably say be transformed by the renewing of your mind realize something the best manuscripts don't have the word your there and secondly, that phrase, renewing of your mind, it doesn't say renewing. That would be a participle. That would relate to a process that we go through. Our minds are changed. But it doesn't say by the renewing of your mind. What does it literally say? By the renewed mind. And what is Paul referring to? the mind of Messiah. Here's the biblical fact. We need to think differently, and to do so, we need a different mind. What mind? The mind of Messiah. We need to replace our mind, how we think, with his mind and how he thinks. Let me give you another biblical example to support this. Now, we'll look at this later on in our study of Matthew, not today, but in the weeks to come. And once Messiah was revealing truth concerning the will of God, he revealed that he was going to Jerusalem for Passover, and there he would be put to death. He would lay down his life. And what did Peter say? Peter said, never. It will not happen. In fact, Peter began, the Bible says, to rebuke Yeshua. That is Jesus of Nazareth, the very Son of God. And what did Messiah say in response? And please pay attention to these words. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Realize something. When we disagree with God, who are we behaving like? The enemy. Satan. He says, I rebuke you, Satan, for you're not thinking as you should. You're thinking as a man thinks. Did you hear that? 
Messiah was displeased with Peter because Peter, a man, was thinking as a man. You might say, well, how else is a person going to think? A human being thinks as a human being. Doing so is never acceptable to God. Why? We need to be a new creation. We need to experience this change, this regeneration that comes by the Holy Spirit. We need to be a new creation in Messiah, and then and only then can we think properly. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 15. The book of Matthew and chapter 15. Now, we've seen something. We've seen that some very important leaders have come from Jerusalem. I'm speaking about the scribes and the Pharisees. And when they observe Messiah's disciples, they say something. Your disciples are transgressing the traditions of the elders. Now realize something. What they're speaking about has nothing to do with the Scripture. It has to do with tradition, a specific tradition concerning washing of your hands. Why? I mentioned this last week. It has nothing, I want to say that again, it has nothing to do with the laws of Tashrut, the dietary laws, what oftentimes we think of when we hear the term kosher. No, Messiah and them we're speaking of defilement, that which is impure, that which is unclean, that according to their tradition, I want to emphasize that, their tradition, that that which is unclean can attach itself to food, and the context would obviously be kosher food. So they're eating food that's acceptable according to the law of Moses, but that which is unclean. That which is impure attaches itself to the food. And if you eat it, if it enters into you through your mouth, they taught that that would render a man unclean. It would defile him. And all of that is the teaching of man, not the word of God, not found in the law of Moses in this context. So what does Messiah say to them when they begin to criticize his disciples? He says to them, and let's begin, look with me to verse 7, Matthew 15 and verse 7. What's the first word there? Hypocrites. Now that's a pretty strong word. Here we have Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, speaking to some very important people that had come from Jerusalem to hear him. And they begin to criticize, they point out that his disciples don't eat bread and doing so previously washing their hands. They could get that defilement from their hands on that bread and swallow it. That's their concern. And here's the biblical truth. They were concerned about defilement, but they really knew better. That's why he called them hypocrites. Hypocrites, biblically, is when someone knows the truth, but they reject it. And in order to conceal their disobedience, in order to justify what they want, they make their actions to be religiously proper. But inwardly, they know that it's not. And that's why Yeshua said to them, hypocrites. And he begins to teach them. Once more, verse 7, hypocrites, and I love this. He immediately goes to prophecy. I've shared with you so many times that when Messiah teaches, he goes to what the prophets taught. And he says here, and it's a word for something that is good something that is well. He says, hypocrites, well prophesied concerning you, Isaiah saying. He goes to the scripture. They didn't. They wanted to go to the writings of men. But the Son of God, 
Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, he goes to prophetic truth. He says, well prophesied concerning you, Isaiah saying. And what did Isaiah reveal about the people? He says, this people draws near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But what's the problem? But their heart, and I want to read this and translate this very carefully and very accurately. The next word that appears in the text is the word for being far away at a distance. And what he says is this. This people, although they say nice things, they, they honor me with their mouth. And they, they, with their lips, they say nice things. But the truth of the matter is far. And then the next word means to withhold something. They withhold themselves far from the truth. Why do I say that? Because they are far from Messiah withholding themselves. And what are they doing? Look at verse 9. Here's their problem. And this next word is so informative. They are embracing the teachings of man, not the teachings of God. They set aside the teachings of God to justify what they want, their own perspective, to see things from their point of view. And what's the next word? It's the word vanity. That word means something which is futile that has and here's something that we need to realize about futility and vanity from a biblical perspective how we should understand it is having no lasting no enduring significance in other words not related to the kingdom of god and whenever we follow the teachings of man setting aside the word of god setting aside God's revelation, His commands. It makes us to be individuals that are living a futile life, a life of vanity that has no kingdom connection. So, He says, but vanity or in futility, they worship Me, teaching as doctrines the precepts, the commandments of man. Here's the problem. It is when individuals teach the thoughts of man, the ways of man, the perspectives of man as the doctrines of God. And that is always going to lead to something that is displeasing to God and has no lasting significance. So what are you basing your life upon? The teachings, the interpretations of men or the word of God? And it's only when we see things from God's perspective can we make wise decisions, doing the things that are pleasing to Him and that are praiseworthy, that are going to bring about not God's love upon you, He loves you, but will bring upon His blessings, His intimacy, His presence in your life. So He says, but in vanity do they worship me teaching the doctrines, teaching as doctrines the precepts, the commandments of men, verse 10. And calling to the crowd, this is Messiah, calling to the crowd, he says to them. Now, they were teaching these Pharisees and these scribes, but he says something. In contrast to that, he says, hear and become wise now this word for hearing demands a response it's hearing so that you can obey and we're not saved by obedience but let me tell you there is a very important outcome there is a byproduct of hearing the word of god and implementing it into your life and what is that god gives understanding god teaches us so it's in the midst of obedience that he takes his truth, his wisdom, right understanding, a godly perspective, and he implants it 
in your mind so that you can have the mind of Christ. That you can have a right understanding of how to make wise decisions, God-honoring decisions. So he turns and he begins to speak to the crowd saying, hear and understand. And what does he say? Not that which enters into the mouth defiles the man. Now, that phrase, and I want to emphasize this for a moment, it literally says, the man. And why is it definite? Because it's speaking about an absolute situation for all of humanity. The definite article, that word, the, appears before man, the man, because it's speaking about a situation that is always, always, always factual. There's no violations of this. Once more, he says, hear and understand, because it is not what enters into the mouth, that is what you eat that defiles a man, but what goes out of the mouth. This is what defiles the man. So he says, there's an absolute situation. What you put into your mouth does not defile you. Those things don't have a spiritual uncleansingness to them. But rather, it is what comes forth from the mouth. That is, those things that come out of a mouth, that is what defiles humanity. Verse, verse 12. After saying that, and I want to emphasize how he said it, and we'll see this in what he says in a moment. He says it with harshness. He was saying what these Pharisees and scribes are teaching, it is false. Do not believe it. And therefore, notice what happens. It says, then his disciples came to, and the implication is came before him and said to him, do you not know that the Pharisees, having heard the word, they have been offended? Now, there's two things wrong here. First of all, when they say, you know, don't you know? You, you need to understand this. He's the son of God. He understands all things. He does everything perfectly and with the right intent. And the fact that these Pharisees, that they are offended it's not important why what are they offended about that their false teaching was exposed by God now he's not doing this with hatred they need to hear the truth and sometimes we need to hear the truth harshly to wake us up this is serious and it's his words that may have offended them but may lead them to repentance. So the disciples, they come to him and say, do you not know that the Pharisees, having heard the word, they are offended? Verse 13, the second half. But the one answering, now I say that, the one answering to emphasize, this is a participle. Most of your Bibles don't Translate it as a participle. A participle has a unique uh, characteristic, a unique purpose. And what is that? A participle describes. There is a descriptive pur purpose whenever a participle is used. And his answer, what we're going to see, describes him. It may be surprising to you. Look again at our text. Verse 13 but the one answering, that's him, Yeshua, said, every plant, that means no exceptions, every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant will be uprooted. And this uprooted, as we've seen in an earlier parable, speaks about being gathered together in bundles and cast into the fire. fire. It is a term of judgment very important 
So he says, they're offended now, but just wait until the judgment comes. So no exceptions. Every plant which is not planted by my heavenly father is uprooted. And then look at verse 14. What does he say? Leave them alone. Don't pay attention to them and their feelings that they're offended. Now, we may think the godly thing to do is to go to them and say, you know, I'm so sorry that I've offended you. And that was not my intent. And I, and I hope that you'll accept my apology. Wait a second. This is the son of God. He never does anything which he has to apologize for. What he's doing is revealing the sincerity of the text. That this, in other words, is not only sincere, but serious. And he says, leave them alone. Why? Blind guides of the blind. And when the blind are leading the blind, both of them, he says, in the verse 14, both of them into the pit, they fall. Now, what is blindness? Why does he say that? Blind guides? Because they're relying upon their own understanding, their own perspective. In other words, they're doing spiritually the best that they can, but they have rejected the truth of God. And therefore, they are not that new creation. They don't have the mind of Christ. And therefore, what are they going to do? Well, here's the implication, and it's a serious one. When you follow blind guides, that is, those who do not have the light of the illumination of the Word of God, that are not seeing things from the perspective of Scripture, they are not giving biblically sound interpretations, they are going to lead you where? To fall into the pit, again, serious business. We need to understand the sincerity of the text and how it's speaking about an outcome that has great significance. Verse 15, but, now this word means in contrast to, but Peter, and as I so frequently say, it's almost always Peter, isn't it, that speaks up, but Peter answers and said to him, Explain to us this parable. Now, this is a good thing. He wants to know the intent of this parable. When he says, it's not the things that enter into your body through your mouth that defiles a person. Peter hears this and he's surprised by this. But rather, it's the things that come out of your mouth. He wants a greater understanding and that's something good so he says peter answers said to him explain to us this parable verse 16 and yeshua said still and this has a degree of, of disappointment are you not maturing are you not growing in your understanding of the word of god failure to do so is very displeasing to God. So he says, still are you, and the word here, your Bible probably says not understanding without understanding, but if you really understand the Greek, it means to be against understanding. God's going to change. If you approach him with a desire to know the truth, he's going to reveal the truth to you. If you pray over the word of God and say, God, help me to understand it, and you're diligent in applying biblical methodology for understanding the word of God, the Holy Spirit, he will be your teacher. You are going to know the truth, but when you rely upon your own understanding, when you say, well, this is how I think it's, it's, it's saying, when you rely upon your own understanding, you are against understanding the truth of God. He says, no, no longer be without understanding because, he says, don't you understand that everything that enters into the mouth also progresses into the belly, right? That's not hard to understand. You eat something, it goes through your mouth, into your belly, and it goes also 
it's cast out into, and this means into the, the sewer, into the toilet. It's, it's garbage. That's what happens. So what they're saying about anything that attaches itself to food, what's the problem? If God doesn't want it for our nutrition, it is going to be cast out. We, as, as the word of God says, are wonderfully made, verse 18. But in contrast to what the Pharisees and the scribes were teaching, but it is what goes forth out of the mouth, out of the heart, it comes forth. What comes out of your heart, what passes through your mouth, meaning what you say, these things defile the man. And it's that same term, the man, for speaking about a universal truth, that which affects all of humanity. And I want you to hear this. It's what we say because what we say manifests, reveal our heart condition. So it's those things that come out of the mouth, what we say from the heart, that is what defiles the man, all of humanity. Verse 19, for what comes forth from the heart? Well, it is evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, thievery, and false testimony and blasphemy. It's these behaviors, he says, that, that defile men. But eating by not washing the hands does not defile a person. So again, this is the third time he's told us what the issue is. It's not Tashrut. It's not the kosher laws. He says, what you eat, it goes into your mouth, into your stomach, and then cast out into the toilet, in the store. It's not important. You're putting the wrong emphasis on something. What's the right emphasis? Not what goes into the person, but what he says. Because one speech reveals their heart condition. And it's what comes forth from your heart that reveals that which is unclean and that which is defiling. So our heart, it's revealed its condition by the words we speak. What wisdom from the Son of God. And my hope is that we apply that wisdom, not to be without understanding, but to be wise in the things of God. Well, until next week, may God richly bless you Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week. May the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.